You're listening to the Tel Aviv Review here on TLV1. I'm Gilad Halpern. Welcome back. I am now joined here in the studio by Professor Lev Greenberg. He's a sociologist at Ben Gurion University of the Negev and author of a new book entitled Moments of Resistance, Movements of Resistance, Politics, Economy and Society in Israel-Palestine, 1931 to 2013. It was recently published in English by Academic Studies Press. Hello, uh, Lev, and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, thank you for an invitation. Um, so m- moments and movements, I mean, we have to explain that um, the V-E are in parenthesis. Yes. Uh, so it, it can be see, read as movements and moments at the same time. So, let, let, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that the title is really revealing. So let's start from there. Moments of resistance, movements of resistance. What can you tell us about this? Usually in the literature, uh, we talk about... Uh, a social movement and the, uh, the assumption is that after some wave of uh, protest people continue the movement and uh, I think that there are moments of uh, explosion of some protest and that they don't necessarily create a social movement but are very important for history mm-hmm. in, the, in history we know that there are critical turning point when something happens that changed the path of history. And uh, I wanted to, to analyze this kind of moment that they are a movement in some specific historical point, but not, don't necessarily continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I show several points like this that uh, are all of them a result of my previous research, mm-hmm. but I put all, them all together. Yeah. Yeah. B- before we get to them, let's spend a bit more time on the definition here. Okay. Um, so by moments of resistance, you mean um, some sort of public manifestation of a resistance, whether it's like a, a, a protest movement or, a, or some sort of a big demonstration or some sort of new political, um, I wouldn't say order, but uh, like a, a, a proposal for a new political order. And by movement, you mean something that has a longer life. It's, uh, the, the longevity there is, is the, the issue. No, no, the, the, the issue is not the longevity, but organization. Mm-hmm. Movements uh, organize, they have a, a, a leaders, they are activists, they have activists, they have a, a discourse, a, a, a plan, what, they, what, they, what they, are they demanded. Uh, moments, they, they, they explode and don't necessarily... You have people that organize in advance. Mm-hmm. And a, a clear example is the last uh, Occupy movement uh, in, in Israel, and not only in Israel. That All around the, the world. Mm. And you didn't have real leaders and organizations that were there, but many, many, many people joined, especially in Israel, and not so much in the United States or mm-hmm. Europe, but in Israel it was very strong, like in Egypt and Tunisia or like in the Middle East. When uh, we talk about the moment, it, the moment can be continuity of the strikes, uh, demonstrations, riots. Uh, I take uh, different cases. Uh, for example, the Intifada lasted uh, four years. Four years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the, at the, the end... Fir- the first Intifada. The first and also intifada. the second, actually. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, or the movement of strikes in uh, 1965. Mm-hmm. That was the previous moment that led to the complete oppression of the working class by the expansion of the borders of Israel. Mm-hmm. My interest is how these uh, explosions of uh, resistance or the expressions of resistance influence history, but not exactly in the way that people wanted. Mm-hmm. That, that, that is my, my point, that there is a gap between the uh, civil society organizations that they, they they feel that their identities their demands their their interests are not recognized by the political system mm-hmm. and then they will go out to the streets people go out to the streets because there is no political space for their demands but political organizations are challenged by these civil society mm-hmm. organizations and in within this challenge uh, they cannot completely ignore. They need to do something. And usually they do something in order to prevent that this will reappear, this mm-hmm. protest will reappear. And all the cases are, these protests were completely 
uh, marginalized yeah. in the long range by political interests that they wanted to... So, so, so why is that? Is it because the um, sort of spontaneous expression of, of protest and, and political angst, if you will, uh, is not translated into something that is more institutionalized, that is more political in, in the, in the uh, I wouldn't say pure sense, but in, in terms of party politics? Uh, the, the important word that you are using is not translated. There is no translation. Civil society has uh, uh, identities, interests, uh, different interests. It's not one. It's not one civil society. You have ethnic groups, national groups, religious groups. You have uh, uh, classes. And I mentioned, diff I, I have in, in my book two class uh, uh, resistance movement, two ethnic riot mov movement, uh, two anti-colonial Movement. One mm -hmm. is against the British and it's binational. Yeah, in 1931. And mm -hmm. another, the other one is Palestinians against the Israelis. Mm -hmm. And uh, also one uh, Occupy movement. In all these cases, the groups that are going to the streets are groups uh, that feel that they are not represented, not sufficiently recognized. And then they demand from the political elites mm -hmm. to recognize their demands, to, to get recognize their leaders and to be represented. The point is this, that if they were not represented in the past, the most uh, usual reaction in the case of Israel, I'm very sorry that most of the cases were oppressed <laughs> in, the long, in the long range, the political uh, elites feel uh, some kind of challenge And they feel that they need to do something to open some space, but then immediately close it. Mm -hmm. They are not translating the demands, in the, and now we are going to represent them. So, so what you're saying is that all these protest movements are set up to fail? No, 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 no. This is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> no, because if there's no, really no, no scope no, for success... I, I, I show different cases of some type of success, And the important point of the book is that I'm explaining all Israeli history of politics through these seven cases of resistant uh, uh, movements mm -hmm. and uh, how they shaped history in a way that not necessarily represented what the people wanted, but influenced the political uh, system in general. It doesn't mean that all cases fail. They have different kinds of success. And, uh, you know, my students were protesting that they didn't see in Israel any real case of complete success. And I, this is the reason that now I moved to compare with other cases that they did succeed to, uh, to get real representation. Mm. Like, for example, Tunisia is a mm -hmm. very good example. Chile is a good example. And now you see even in, in Spain some organization of the... Main people that were doing this uh, protest in, the, in indignados. The, the, the indignados, now mm. they have a very strong party that mm -hmm. is challenging all the other parties. You're talking about uh, Podemos. 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 Mm. And, and this is exactly the point, that the political uh, elite, existing political elite, are very afraid mm -hmm. of the challenge and the possibility that this uh, m uh, resistance movement will be represented really. But if we go back to some of your theoretical underpinning to this, to this research, there are very obvious power relations here and the established politics is always more powerful than the resistant forces. So if the establishment applies itself to stifle the, the protest, there's really very little chance that the threat that they pose to the establishment is real. Okay, I, I, I want to divide your, your question into two mm -hmm. points. The axioma that they are always more powerful is not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, sometimes civil society has so much power that they can change politics. Mm -hmm. This is one point that is very important uh, to understand. In second is that sometimes there are political elites that have a clear interest to join the masses and to represent them. And then in these cases also they can change uh, uh, politics. Uh, and the, the examples that I gave you are uh, clear examples that the, the political actors understood that this uh, moment of resistance is a good moment for them mm -hmm. to join them and then represent them. Uh, this is possible. The case of Israel is very sad because <laughs> this is a case that we have very, very strong political parties and they have a, a lot of 
power to to manipulate mm -hmm. the civil society. Yeah, rallying power. They have a great rallying power, right? Yeah, you, you know, it's uh, from the very beginning, mm -hmm. from the from before the British. Uh, no, no, the, during the British uh, uh, mandate, uh, you have a very strong ruling political party. I, I, I assume you heard about it, Mapai. Yeah. And this party uh, uh, controlled everything. So uh, this is the starting point. But in addition, you have strong divisions within civil mm -hmm. society. First of all, and most important, between Arabs and Jews. So you can manipulate the, mm -hmm. the Jews because the Jews are depending on their political parties. Also, the political uh, elites of the Palestinians can manipulate mm -hmm. their, their civil society. Yeah, the, the, these divisions work in their favor at the end of the day. Uh, and and th this is the point, mm -hmm. that I show how political parties manipulate internal divisions of civil society between Jews and Arabs, and later on between Oriental Jews and uh, European Jews. Mm -hmm. And these uh, tensions became the main uh, tools to control the civil society by the politicians in the Israeli case. So if you read my book, I think you will learn the complexities of the Israeli politics. Uh, I have a visitor uh, from the uh, United States uh, a week ago, and he read my book and he said, tell me, do you think there is any case so complex like yours? <laughs> uh, I assume it doesn't only apply to, to the, the topic that you explore in your book. I mean, any, anything that you can say about Israel is perhaps the most complicated version of this issue that you can come up with. Yes, it's complicated, but it's not. Uh, the point is that uh, uh, the political elites still are very, very, very powerful, still have a lot of uh, uh, tools to manipulate civil society and to prevent repression. Is it because of the internal divisions within the civil society? Is it because of the external threat that, you know, this siege mentality that is really prevalent in the Israeli mentality? It, or all these factors combined? You know, uh, the capacity to manipulate a threat is not peculiar to the Israeli case. Politicians like it very much. Because if you are under threat, you need me to protect you. Mm -hmm. And this is the case with external enemies, and nationalism is based on that. But this is a case also in ethnic divisions, because you are afraid of the other, then you need me, the politician, to protect you. Mm -hmm. And then this is part of the manipulations that I, I'm describing in the case. But there are other types of manipulations, for example, um, cooptation. Mm -hmm. to take the leaders of the resistant group, of the oppressed group, to give the leaders, only the leaders, some sort of power mm -hmm. and to maintain the basic structure of inequality between the groups. Mm -hmm. This is the case of the Oslo agreements and peace uh, negotiations where the Israeli uh, uh, military was unable to repress uh, the Intifada. Then they came to the conclusion they needed Arafat to do it. Mm -hmm. And Rabin said it very, very clearly. Arafat will have no democratic limit, uh, yeah. limitations to rec with, represent the yeah. Palestinians. He would do it without the High Court and without yeah. B'Tselem. Right? Exactly. That, that's the famous Without quote. civil rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't have civil rights, I can use... And it's probably the same, case, uh, the same uh, uh, for the Black Panthers, right? No, uh, the Black Panthers were, was a kind of manipulation of uh, the tribal enmity between the Oriental Jews and, mm. and Ashkenazi Jews because then you have the two big parties. The left and the right represent uh, ethnic tribes. Mm -hmm. And this was constructed s since the ethnic riot. Then the Labour Party and the left repressed uh, the Oriental Jews and then the right wing became the defenders of the mm -hmm. Oriental Jews against the Ashkenazi. This is the construction. But pay attention to these two uh, examples I'm giving you. The Oslo agreements are lasting until now, and the, the Palestinian authorities are cooperating with Israel uh, security forces until now. And this is still a reaction to the Intifada, first Intifada movement I'm talking about. Probably because they don't have a better alternative. The Palestinians? Yeah. Yes, but they, they were oppressed by their own leaders. That, yeah. that is oh, the point. Oh, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. And in the case of uh, ethnic uh, uh, riots, until the last elections, you still have the construction of this rivalry between uh, Oriental Jews and yeah. uh, European Jews, and uh, we cannot move from there. Yeah. L looking back at the seven case studies that you explore in okay. your book, would you say that any of them had any 
lasting impact on the um, I wouldn't say the pro progression of of history, or did they um, emerge all and disappear? And, no, 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 all of them have a lasting impact. That is very crucial. Otherwise, I couldn't choose them. Mm -hmm. But not exactly what they wanted. Yeah. That is that is the point. For example, I, I give the example of the uh, strikes during the full employment period in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It ended with the expansion of the borders of Israel and the annexation of one million Palestinians then in the West Bank and Gaza as cheap, unorganized workers. <laughs> they have a lasting impact, but not exactly what the workers were uh, demanding. Also, the, the first intifadas, I gave you an example, yeah. of, of the, or in the ethnic riots in 59 and, and 71. Yeah, but, but, but the main issue that they were setting out to resolve was not resolved. I mean, there, there was no, there was no, 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 no equality or any semblance thereof of uh, uh, the Mizrahi Jews in Israel. There wasn't a resolution to the, <laughs> to the oppression of the Palestinians that the Palestinians were calling for in the first intifada. And, you know, the, the full employment protest, okay, but it was resolved from, from an, perhaps another, uh, another angle, not quite what the, uh, what the protesters set out to demand. You're looking in my book something that you will not find. <laughs> Conflict resolution. <laughs> this is not. This is not a, a, a book about conflict resolution. This is a book about social, economic, political, national, ethnic conflicts and how they develop. Mm -hmm. And this development is very important in order to understand where we are today. No, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, exactly to draw lessons from 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 history, and the lessons uh, that I can draw from it are very bleak. No, no, no. I are, I I show very. I think interesting theoretical lessons. You mm -hmm. want you you're, you're not looking for uh, theoretical lessons. You want <laughs> solutions. Exactly. <laughs> that is what <laughs> I I don't know. I I. I tell my students all the time when they ask this question yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. if I had solutions I wouldn't be a professor <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but the point the, yeah. that I, I did some theoretical conclusions very important for example class struggle is usually at the beginning recognized represented there are some negotiations because when workers strike you cannot ignore them mm -hmm. and in the next step the power is completely broken by structural means. In the first case, in the 60s, it was broken by the insertion of uh, non-organized workers from mm -hmm. abroad. Exactly the same in Europe. Mm -hmm. They took uh, workers from Turkey, workers from, from North Africa, workers from India, and then you have what you have today in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the second point was against the strong workers, those that are in the public sector, professional workers in 1980, mm -hmm. and they were broken by the neoliberal economy. The, the neoliberal economy, it, it means that we cannot break the power of the strong workers through uh, bringing workers from uh, the third world. Mm -hmm. We need to break their power by weakening the, uh, the state. Right. The, and the capacity to, to the state to to employ them, and, and the employment of competing workers that may be even professional and et cetera, et cetera, but they have no a, a collective agreement. Mm -hmm. But the, but the, the the flip side of it was that those who were previously the working class had another class coming in that was lower than them, and by by implication, became more middle class. Uh, and and it, this divides. The workers, obviously, and this is a solution for capitalism, clearly. Yeah. But it's not by mistake that I end with the Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. Because the Occupy movement, in some places, I, I, I'm not talking about the uh, United States and uh, England. I'm talking about places where these were mass movements, really mass movements, that took millions to the street and uh, have more than 70% uh, support of the population. Mm -hmm. And these mass movements uh, included middle classes and lower classes. And this mass movement uh, created some kind of identity of we the people. Yeah. That is a kind of demand of democratization of the system because the neoliberal system is not democratic. This is, must be clear. It's a rule of a very small minority that influence directly 
the the politicians, the treasury, and they rule mm-hmm. in a way that most of us are outside. Yeah. And this is the reason. Uh, this is my point in uh, politi- opening political spaces, that when you are not represented, you go to the streets. Yeah, you go to the streets. And, and also, I think that the, the Occupy movement, especially here in Israel, is perhaps the best example of the strategies of the of the power to water down the, the protest. I mean, they, 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 they basically took every measure possible to, to do it. Exactly. This, I ended my book in 2013 because that was the last day that I wrote. Mm-hmm. But we could write it now. right yeah. now. It's, exa- it it's even worse. Yeah. Okay, Professor Lev Greenberg, uh, thank you very much for coming in. You're the author of uh, Movements, Moments of Resistance, Politics, Economy and Society in Israel-Palestine, 1931 to 2013, as well as a sociologist at Ben-Gurion University. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you very much for your invitation.